Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Había que apoyar. Ahora debemos comenzar. Good morning, all participants in the launching on the report on the state of the climate in Latin America and the Caribbean and a high level conference that has the title of impacts related to weather, climate, and water in Latin America and the Caribbean, alliances to strengthen early alert systems of multiple threats. This regional event is sponsored together by the regional associations three, Latin America, uh, four, Central and North America of the WMO and is co-organized with the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean and the Office of the United Nations for the Reduction of Risk of Disaster to present this report in Latin America and the Caribbean and allow a dialogue with the partners in the regions on opportunities to strengthen early alert systems in Latin America and the Caribbean. The two main objectives of this event are promoting a high-level partnership between regional institutions to identify specific areas of collaboration to support the consolidation of early alert systems through forecast based on impacts and alerts based on meteorological, hydrological, and climatic risks. This will allow to identify key messages of the region to promote them in the conference COP27 of the on United Nations on climate change. To begin, we have a message from the Professor Petrin Tallis, Secretary General of the WMO. Please, ahead with the message. World Meteorological Organization in Geneva. I'm sorry that I cannot uh, join you at the event uh, in Cartagena, uh, but I'm happy to deliver this message uh, through, through video. And, and I would be happy to thank uh, the partners of this event, uh, especially ECLAC and uh, and ministers and ministries uh, and, and all the audience uh, and WMOPRs who are present at this uh, event. We started a new practice to publish uh, uh, regional climate uh, reports uh, a couple of years ago and, uh, and this is now the second uh, report for Latin America and, uh, and Caribbean region where you are very vulnerable to impacts of, uh, of climate change. Uh, we have, of course, we have uh, this global challenge and, uh, and, and what, what we have seen from the most recent uh, WMO and IPCC reports is that we have uh, started seeing the impacts of climate change uh, hitting all parts of the world. We have a growing amount of heat waves. Uh, at the moment, there's a major heat wave going on in Europe uh, with record-breaking temperatures. Uh, but this is happening. This has been happening worldwide. It, it has been observed. Uh, in all parts of the world. And some parts of the world have become drier because of climate change, uh, 
and uh, we have started seeing uh, more flooding events in some parts of the world and of course this kind of variability between drought and flooding also in, 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 in sometimes in the same same region. In your part of the world, uh, what are the specific features is that, uh, that, uh, that the Caribbean region and Central American region are exposed to uh, tropical storms, to hurricanes, and, uh, and then we have been warming days and we have been storing more than 90% of the liquid seas to oceans, and that means that we have more energy for the tropical storms and, uh, and also uh, there's more evaporation from the ocean, uh, this uh, a little bit more than one degree warming so far has contributed uh, to uh, around 10% increase of the humidity, which means that when it rains uh, as part of these storms, it rains more, so there's more severe flooding, flooding problem happening. And that's one of the uh, very specific features of your, your, your region, and we have seen also the most dramatic uh, uh, impacts of, uh, of those storms hitting, hitting the, uh, the Caribbean islands uh, uh, Dominica is having the world record. You have lost 800% uh, of your your GDP in one one hurricane in 2017. Uh, last year's uh, hurricane season was uh, was uh, uh, third strongest uh, season, and uh, and we may see stronger uh, seasons in the future. And and these storms can be observed in wider areas, as as we have seen, for example, in in in, in southern Africa during recent uh, years. And then, uh, 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 of course, you are uh, also experiencing uh, the melting of uh, glaciers. Uh, what's happening in the Anya region uh, is having, having an impact on, on, on the availability of uh, fresh water uh, in, in, in the rivers, uh, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, the scenarios are not very promising from that perspective. It seems that uh, this melting of glaciers will continue for the coming Hundreds of, hundreds of years, even thousands of years, and uh, and that will also contribute to the sea level rise, especially the melting of uh, of uh, Greenland and Antarctic uh, glaciers. So we will see long, long, and more persistent uh, melting of those uh, glaciers, and also uh, more permanent. Uh, and, and the sea level rise in your part of the world has been above the uh, average of the of the world. And uh, then uh, the third specific issue in your part of the world is, uh, is, is this Amazonian rainforest and, uh, and, and its uh, future. And, uh, and uh, we have already seen uh, that uh, Amazonian rainforest has become uh, drier. Uh, this, uh, we, there has been a, a local uh, climate change uh, uh, thanks to deforestation, and, and that has been uh, boosting, boosting this uh, drying of the region. At the same time, we have been able to observe that uh, at least some parts of the Amazonian region have become source of carbon instead of uh, sink of carbon, and, uh, and it's very important to stop this deforestation, which is partly related to the, uh, the meat production and, uh, and uh, feed for, for cattle, cattle sellers. Globally, uh, we made a great step uh, forward at the last COP26 uh, in Glasgow, especially the richest countries were making pledges that would keep us on 1.5 degrees uh, track, uh, but unfortunately many others didn't, and uh, that's why we are not heading towards 1.5 degrees warming at the moment, uh, rather towards 2.5 to 3 degrees uh, uh, range uh, with growing amount of negative impacts of uh, climate change. And besides uh, 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 climate mitigation, it's important to pay attention to climate uh, adaptation. And uh, one of the very powerful ways to adapt to climate change is to invest in early warning services. And that's why uh, Secretary General Guterres has given WMO a mandate to prepare a major uh, action plan and initiative uh, to be approved by the COP27 in Salma Sheikh in Egypt uh, this uh, November. And we are working for that, and uh, our aim is to invest in basic observing system as part of uh, our systematic observation financing facility program. We have already this cruise program for early warning service uh, development uh, that needs to be scaled up and continued. And we also have to pay attention to uh, ob observing systems of, uh, of hydrology and, and related services. These components, uh, uh, contain this uh, early warning service initiative that we are 
we are promoting and, and we are seeking for partnership uh, of uh, financing institutions like uh, World Bank, uh, regional banks, uh, and, um, and a Green Climate Fund uh, and a UNDP to coordinate the big package uh, to be approved by the COP27. Altogether, there's a need of, uh, of 1.5 billion uh, US dollars investments uh, during the coming five years to get 100% coverage of early warning services and uh, improve the basic uh, observing systems. So we have major gaps in uh, uh, island states, uh, Africa, and also some parts of, uh, of Latin, Latin America, and that needs to be improved. With these words, I would like to wish you a successful meeting and, uh, and thanks for your con great contribution to this, uh, this report that you are dealing with uh, today. And, uh, and we are happy to uh, continue collaborating with you also in the future. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor Peter Italas. Para continuar con el programa, uh, quiero. To continue with the program, I want to inform that we're already connected with 1,400 people via Zoom, and we have participation of more than 73 countries in Africa, Europe, and America. So we have a very broad audience right now, and this transmission is done in real time in YouTube channels. I wish to invite Dr. Wang Yang Shang, Subsecretary General of the WMO, to present the report on climate in Latin America and Caribbean 2021. Dr. Zhang, you have the floor. You can launch the report. Yeah. Thank you, moderator. Dear Madam, Gracias. The president of WMO Regional Association 3 and uh, Mr. Uh, Ivan and uh, the president of WMO Region 4 and uh, uh, Celeste, the first vice president of WMO and dear PRs and uh, colleagues and uh, online at, uh, at, uh, participants. And uh, uh, good morning from uh, uh, this uh, beautiful city, but uh, I know that uh, we have a world participants, and any, anyhow, it's a uh, welcome you all to this uh, great event. Uh, as, uh, we are all happy to hear the high-level briefing and by the opening remark from Professor Talas, the Secretary General of World Meteorological Organization, and uh, basically he opening remark captured most of the significant uh, uh, points in the report. And uh, take the chance, I really would like to thank all the people who contribute to this uh, it's, uh, it's great work. And uh, yeah, uh, let me st uh, start for this PowerPoint. And uh, also I thank to my colleagues who prepared this quite uh, com comprehensive as uh, a briefing, uh, it's a PowerPoint and uh, at a little bit long, however, that be more than half years of many people contribute to this great work. So please be uh, patient. And uh, certainly, that's still much less than the full report. Uh, first, uh, show you some numbers. And the first, the, the second of this uh, kind of Latin America climb, regional climate statement. And uh, led by the WMO Regional Association 3 and 4. And uh, we have uh, 55 experts from the region and uh, around the world. And uh, it's uh, working on this report. And uh, also we have uh, 19 international and uh, regional institutions, 29 national meteorological and uh, hydrological services, and uh, also 10 United Nations agencies directly involved in this report. And uh, so the outline of this report, actually now you can download from WMO website. At first, is a regional climate, and uh, followed by extreme events. And the third part of it will be climate-related impacts and risks. And finally, it's a WMO and also in a region that uh, how we prepare to enhance our climate resilience and adaptation policy action. And so this is a quite a comprehensive and a very valuable uh, it's a report and can be used by many, many 
uh, organizations. Uh, at the beginning, you will see the foreword from Professor Talas and the Secretary General of World Metallurgical Organization, and also you see the preface from the uh, uh, Economic Commission uh, of Latin America and the Acting Executive Secretary. And uh, I really would like to thank them to make a greater support and also guide this uh, regional climate report development. And uh, as uh, Professor Tala said, this has been a practice start from several years ago. And uh, you may know that WMO have a global climate statement more than 20 years. But uh, we start a regional climate, climate report, try to reflect more regional specific uh, facts and also uh, regional, uh, more detailed extreme events and uh, uh, across all WMO regions. So this is the second in our region. Uh, first, you see the temperature. I do believe that you also feel that the same the temperature high in the room, right? And, uh, but the fact is that you see, in the past 30 years, from 1991 to 2021, and we have a see the temperature increase in the region was around 0 0.2 degree, the average rate compared to the 30 years average from 19, 1961 to 1990, the, which is 0.1 degree per decade. Even looks like the number is small, but it's quite, quite significant. Under the right panel, you will see that the temperature was above 1981 to 2010 average in all sub-regions. So this is a very clear that, that, that uh, it's warming globally and regionally. Uh, this gives a more uh, detail. Uh, it's uh, in the some region and uh, even some country. And you will see the, the dot that the red one is means above it's uh, average, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really it's a positive anomaly, and certainly if you see some, it's a uh, it's, uh, blue part, which is uh, only a few dots uh, and, uh, across the whole region. So the temperature increase is uh, very visible. Uh, second important climate variables is the precipitation, rainfall. And what's the rainfall situation? And uh, in comparison to the temperature, that the more homogeneity is, uh, is uh, warming. But here you see the precipitation, that you see the blue part representing the above anomaly, and uh, the red part is uh, less rainfall than average. So this shows you the pattern and uh, across the region, and also see some specific in some country like Mexico and uh, Central America and Caribbean, but uh, you will see the whole picture, which is really see the rainfall pattern is changing as well due to the climate change. Glacier is uh, critical. And uh, this is uh, uh, our, you know, it's a solid water reservoir. But uh, you will see the acceleration of the glacier melting across the region. And uh, we have been losing the mass over the past decades. and. Uh, the, the loose rates are among the highest globally. So this is a, will be a big concern. That's why this region often refer to the water, to the, to the hydrological issues as a, one of the priority in our region. But that's a, that's a real fact, which I do believe that uh, you national observation can also demonstrate and, and this evidence. Sea level. We have a long coastline in our region, but the sea level in the region continue to rise and at the faster rate than globally among the Atlantic coast of South America and south of the equator and also subtropical North Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a clear evidence, even you will see the exact number uh, in the different sub-region. Tropical cyclone, and the Secretary General in his opening remark said that last year, 20, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, 21, uh, we have a few, uh, it's uh, 
uh, it's a strong hurricane, but uh, still have a quite a significant uh, impact to the region. So this is the one uh, one slide which uh, I can show you the happy precipitation and the flood due to this uh, extreme rainfall, especially the hurricane, and across the region led to hundreds of lives lost, tens of thousands of homes destroyed or damaged, and hundreds of thousands of people displaced. There are a lot of detail in the report, and uh, I hope that you can pay attention, for example, the, the corner, that uh, some part of the Brazil, uh, 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 Brazil that, uh, that lead to uh, the economic loss, 3.1 billion, and uh, more than 800,000 affected people. So this is uh, quite significant uh, in the region. Uh, certainly, too much water is a problem, but the too less water is also a big, uh, big problem for us as well. So drought affected uh, several countries and regions in Latin America uh, during last year, including most of uh, Mexico, part of the Central America and the Caribbean, and the parts of the subtropical South America. So these are uh, uh, a lot of facts in the report, and uh, hope that uh, you can uh, also uh, uh, refer to the report and refer to the national report with regard to the draws. Heat wave and wildfires. Certainly, this is also largely due to the droughts as well due to the temperature increase, which lead to and some extreme heat wave events and wildfires. So I do not want to go to detail but you see the dots are the facts observed and recorded and, uh, in the past year. Uh, also, it's not, uh, it's uh, someone feels st strange, and uh, we have a cold wave, but uh, heat wave, but we also have a cold waves. But uh, that's really true, and uh, intense cold waves or cold spell episode occurred in many locations of southern South America. No, mainly from June to August. And you see the, 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 the map that shows the, the location as well. That's the real, it's a, the country impacted by the, by the cold waves. Uh, deforestation. This is uh, something, uh, it's uh, not a, it's a natural, but something uh, linked to the human activities. Deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon for rainforest doubled, doubled compared to the 2009 to 2018 average, reaching its highest level since 2009. So this is a serious concerns. So we should really see that uh, what kind of policy really can uh, save the world and also it's, a, it's a try to mitigate uh, the, the climate change, climate impact to our region. Uh, ocean and the coastal ecosystem, as you know, uh, yes, uh, this also, it's an uh, impact uh, of this uh, climate change. And uh, these are a lot of uh, neg uh, negative impact, which you can see clearly from some of the observations. I have one more slide after this uh, agriculture and the food security. And uh, we know that uh, the food security is a big issue uh, across the globe, but uh, also it's critical for our region to pay greater attention to see the climate impact to agriculture and the food security. And uh, I encourage you to read detail in this report and find some more on the facts which you can uh, really uh, it's, uh, alert our society and uh, to pay more attention to the food security of climate change. Yeah, this is what I refer to the impact with the coast you see that uh, 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 this uh, is a photo, and uh, uh, Saksam, and, uh, and the, the photo was taken by a drone, and see the larger areas which uh, really impact uh, tourists and also impact uh, the bio system uh, along the coast. And uh, this um, become more and more visible in many, many of the countries that which can uh, have uh, uh, accumulated economic loss and uh, in this uh, region, it can be uh, it's, uh, uh, 50 to 70 billion during the period of to 2020 to 2023. Uh, and the climate impact to our society is, uh, can be seen very strong 
evidence the displacement and the climate induced the migrations. Extreme climate events, uh, slow onset climate change, influenced human mobility pattern and induced population displacement throughout 2021 in our region. So this is uh, quite uh, clear, uh, it's uh, evidence, many, many uh, it's, uh, events and uh, show the, 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 the clearly the evidence, the, the impact to our uh, people in the region. Yeah, and uh, dear colleagues, that WMO community now is a uh, act up, really make a great effort improving multi-hazard risk information system and also our climate service. So we realized, uh, and all the government realized the importance of strengthening climate service, including but not limited to the early warning, is increasingly recognized in the region. And uh, over 60% of the national determined contributions report. This is an NDC is referred to the com commitment to the Paris Agreement. They all mentioned about the early warning. So this is a greater success of WMO communication at, uh, at the UNFCCC at the global and the regional level that the climate change and the national determined contribution uh, and now is uh, really pay attention to the extreme events and also early warning. So this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a big progress, but we need more, more effort, continue to promote to communicate the climate change and the climate impact to the global and the regional uh, aspects. We do have, a, you know, uh, it's a, a, some efforts that uh, it's also project uh, and uh, big initiatives like a multi-hazard early warning system the data from the WMO members suggest that the Latin American region face severe early warning capacity gap. And uh, I do not want to go to detail, but if you look at the, at, at the, 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 the picture, and uh, you will see what are the critical gap we are facing, and we must make a great effort to fill the gap to enhance our capability for the early warning and the face on the uh, multi-hazard uh, information system to facilitate our government and uh, all the agency take a collective action to, to, to mitigate the climate change impact. Uh, this is my last slide and uh, as uh, Professor Talas, uh, it's a, uh, it's a briefed us in his opening remark that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has tasked World Meteorological Organization to lead the efforts and uh, present an action plan to achieve this goal at the next UN climate reference in Egypt in the coming September. And uh, he made the call very strong and would like to see in the next five years, uh, and uh, we should have all the nation have the early warning system and the capability should be greatly enhanced. But uh, certainly, in addition to this, WMO also have a new initiative called the Global Greenhouse Gas Budget Monitoring System. And my colleague, Lars Peter, now is the inner secretary, the leader for the secretary to support to all the members. I do hope that our region also be uh, proactive to respond to the call from UN Secretary General and from World Meteorological Organization for the new initiatives. So this is my open call for all the PRs, all the uh, uh, dear colleagues, and uh, back to your nation, report to your minister vertically, and especially for the uh, your national delegation, which will attend the COP27 in Egypt, to give a strong support to the WMO initiative and uh, get the needed resources, 1.5 billion in the next five years, and uh, greatly strengthen our capability, build our powerful system, and uh, build our greater partnership with all the members in the region, in the country. We do have a, you know, a existing big programs like GMS, like CRUISE, like GFCS, like SOF. But all of this will underpin 
our early warning system and also global greenhouse gas multi budget monitoring system. Dear colleagues, thank you so much for your patience, and uh, it's uh, really my big thanks to all of you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sang, for this instructive presentation with the general view of the current status with so many challenges in the climate matters for our countries, for our directors, and for our population, particularly with new problems that have been included by the weather, like migration, and uh, which explains the message of the United Nations uh, Secretariat for WMO asking you to lead this effort and to present an action plan for early warnings at an international level. Now I am going to invite Dr. Carlos Correa, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia, which is the country that is hosting this meeting. He has sent us a declaration that we presented it with a video sent from Bogota. A Warm greeting to the honorable table, the honorable delegation, observers, and everyone who is present here in the room and in our live transmission. The ch moment for change is here. We're facing very demanding moments, but we're in the moment to make these challenges into opportunities. This report on the status of the weather in Latin America and the Caribbean manifests the great impacts that we're having with climate change in our ecosystems the food security, the hydric one, and the and people's health, and the fight against poverty. Science is showing you that our region be, continues to be vulnerable before these climate changes. The tendency of, war, of heat is raising the Andes of the, uh, of the tropical, uh, is losing their surface to a 30% ever since the 80s, and we have the hurricane in the Atlantic, the most active one in 2021, where Colombia, for the first time, has faced a hurricane that was category five in our archipelago uh, in San Andres and Santa Galina and Los Cayos. Our region has been affected by migrations and weather displacements, phenomenons that have increased in the last eight years. IPCC indicates that the adaptation is fragmented in its majority and designed to respond to these current impacts or risk of short term, reducing the opportunity of adaptation in a transformational way. And during this week, we have discussed the importance of improving the under global understanding of the weather status as the forecasting of futures weather scenarios, it is a necessity to work to improve our early warning system to keep it and to strengthen our current structure is a challenge to comply with all the willingness of the National Global Watch. The supply of data is a reality that we must guarantee to make sure that our region counts with this uh, sponsorship so we can have all the data necessary that we have in this calling as it is the adaptation for this weather change. It is time to move the synergies to make sure that we have the survival sources and defend in an act our biodiversity in an active way. Our legacy consists of the implementation of actions that are inclusive, equitative, and sustainable and global governance towards the future that can have more hope. I can say today that Colombia made their ambitions into an action. Our environmental, social, economical agenda reflects how since the commitment of a nation, you can contribute to the future that we all expect to have. President Duque is leaving behind a great legacy with everything around weather, with the creation of the intersectorial commission of the presidential cabinet for the weather action as an instance for the coordination guidelines and assessment of all the 
advances or progress that we have achieved with all the international commitments that we have with our country. We have increased the ambitions uh, for this weather watch, reducing the greenhouse gases emission in a 51% in 2030. As it is transversal from these policies, we adapted the climate law. This is a milestone in the legislation of our country that it is to foster environmental education, to reduce forest deforestation to zero in 2030, and restore a million hectares of these forests in an articulated way with the roadmap towards the neutralization of carbon that has been marked in the long-term strategy for 2050. And I would like to wrap this up by acknowledging the great work that our EDM director has carried out, engineer Yolanda Gonzalez. Thanks to her, we have been able to achieve to consolidate our n needs as a region. Thanks to the EDM team, the calling is to have action. We need to consolidate our materialism and look at our priorities with the purpose to have the financial sustainability that we need. Our commitment is with the people. Early warnings, early actions. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlos Correa, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia for his very clear and wise analysis. He has underlined that the region is vulnerable and it is necessary to assure our survival needs and also the global and regional uh, governance and something that is very important in Colombia, the promotion or fostering of environmental education. Now we have a message from Ms. Mami Imatori, special rep of the General Secretary of the United Nations and head of the United Nations Office for the Risk of Disasters. Go ahead. Dr. Carlos Correa, a Minister of Environment of Colombia, Professor Petri Talas, WMO Secretary General, Dr. Mario Cimoli, Acting Executive Secretary of ECLAC, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to take part in launching this important publication the second report on the state of the climate in Latin America and the Caribbean, 2021. This region is no stranger to disasters. Indeed, it is the second most disaster-prone region in the world. Last year, climatological and meteorological events affected more than 3.7 million people. The region saw the third most active Atlantic hurricane season ever, producing 21 named storms seven of which turned into full-blown hurricanes. The region also experienced soaring temperatures among its warmest years on record. Weather-related and other disasters have revealed how complex risks can be and how interconnected our world is. Global and local challenges travel up and down the same two-way street. And a shock that affects one sector can create profound consequences in another. Not surprisingly, People already at risk or marginalized are often the hardest hit. The COVID-19 pandemic offers a quintessential example of how interconnected risk can create severe upheaval, particularly when intersecting with climate change impact. For example, last year, the fallout from hurricanes Eta and Iota collided with lingering COVID-19 impact. The result was that 7.7 .7 million people in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua faced high levels of food insecurity. Addressing the complex nature of risk is at the heart of what we do. In May, UNDRR convened the 2022 Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, hosted by the government of Indonesia. Our uniting theme was From Risk to Resilience. Its recommendations were captured in the seven-point Bali Agenda for Resilience. First and foremost is the need for risk management to become a shared responsibility across sectors. Getting on track to achieve the Sender Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals requires decision makers to adopt comprehensive climate and disaster risk management that puts people first. Doing so requires current data and timely information. 
publications like the State of Climate in Latin America and the Caribbean provide an invaluable foundation. Since first published in 2020, the report has been a critical source of science-based information. It also unifies the work of experts across levels and sectors towards long-term multi-sectoral solutions. Among the report's many recommendations is how to make progress on target G of the Sendai framework to expand access to multi-hazard early warning systems. This echoes the call by the UN Secretary General that all people everywhere be covered by an early warning system within five years. UNDRR thanks WMO and its partners for this valuable report, and we hope to see decision makers immediately act on its findings by prioritizing comprehensive climate and disaster risk management. We have the data. Now it is time to act. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jimatori, for your message where you have underlined the climate change impact in the Pan American, the Caribbean that produces insecurity and that for us, for this reason, therefore, this re annual report represents a guideline for those actions that we must take in a way that she says that is multi-sectorial. So to wrap this introduction up, we have the declaration of Ms. Diane Carlos, head of the sub-regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean in Puerto España. She is with us online. Ms. Corliss, the word is yours, or the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning to all distinguished representatives. Uh, ECLAC is very pleased to uh, partner with the WMO and the UNDRR in the launch of the 2021 report on the state of the climate in Latin America and the Caribbean. I convey to you the very best wishes of Acting Executive Secretary Mario Cimoli for a successful event today. Let me also thank Acting uh, Assistant Secretary General Jan for the presentation of the report, demonstrating with clarity the very real threat that the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, face as a result of climate change. As we approach the peak of the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season, predicted by NOAA to be an above normal one this year, this meeting could not be more timely or more urgent. There's no question that the countries of our region, particularly the small states of the Caribbean and Central America, are highly vulnerable to climate change impacts, natural disaster which threaten the economic, social, and environmental sustainability of, of these countries. We in the Caribbean have still not yet forgotten the devastating impact of hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, hacking over five storms that left a path of destruction across the Caribbean, leaving countries like Dominica with damage and losses equivalent to 226% of GDP recovery from which they are still um, uh, working on. Hurricane Dorian in 2019 caused over 3.4 billion in damage. During 2021, yet another very active season, many countries in the Caribbean exp experienced major flooding, landslides, uh, foggy tropical storms, Elsa and Greece. For countries across the Eastern Caribbean, these hydroclimatic impacts were compounded by a volcanic eruption in St. Vincent, causing major dislocation, damage, and loss. And then there were <clears throat> heavy rainfalls and floods across Guyana, Suriname, and regions of Central America, affecting housing, freshwater sources, a range of social welfare issues, population displacement, um, and of course, increasing food insecurity and post-pandemic health concerns compounding the circumstance. And I could go on. Uh, over the past 30 years, the wider Caribbean has experienced more than 400 such events, most of them hydroclimatic. And as reported by ASG Zhang, uh, persistent warming trends continue to fuel the frequency and ferocity of these hydroclimatic events. 
Caribbean coastlines, integral to tourism products in these countries are also subject not only to increased coral bleaching, but also to the annual occurrence of massive cyclists on blooms, the widespread deposit of the seaweed on beaches and the wider coastal zones has resulted in significant ecosystem damage and the disruption of economic and social life for numerous Caribbean coastal communities, exacerbating poverty, rendering more fragile, already vulnerable populations. The imperative to continually source or reassign already scarce human institutional and financial resources for disaster management has undermined the capacities of the countries of our region to sustainably recover and rebuild better after each event. These multidimensional vulnerabilities and challenges influenced by climate change demand widest consideration of strategic responses for redress, not least through advocacy, solidarity, partnership, and international cooperation. ECLAC therefore unequivocally supports the call made by Secretary General Guterres this year for the pursuit of a new initiative that ensures that peoples are protected, all people are protected by multi-hazard early warning systems within the next five years. Such an ambitious objective to be spearheaded by the WMO will require the active engagement and support of all relevant partners, both within the UN system as well as across the wider international community. We are we at ECLAC are agree that the best way to mitigate and moderate the impact of multidimensional exogenous shocks is by planning for and investing in effective resilience building strategy. By exploring the optimal measures for adaptation, for best to improve forecasting and planning for more effective risk reduction in this regard, the use of appropriate technologies, including multi-hazard early warning systems and scientific applications is vital. What is needed is strengthening the technological, institutional, including data management capacities to facilitate the integration of disaster risk information into sustainable development planning. In this effort, working in partnership and solidarity is key, as we in the UN system are demonstrating today. ECLAC is working with the regional intergovernmental bodies uh, uh, to, to achieve exactly this. CIDEMA, um, the CARICOM Development pa Partner Group, the C C Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. We work with as well to improve capacities in the use of geospatial technologies as required tools for effective dis disaster risk management. Um, and, 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 and through this collaboration, we have identified the need for data-driven, regularly updated national vulnerability assessments. Disaster risk reduction and resilience building strategies are cost-effective investments towards preventing future damage and loss. Of course, significant financial investment is essential to the success of these outcomes. The question we must address this morning, therefore, is how best to harness the resources, the commitment, and the goodwill of all partners in strategic and well-coordinated partnership to strengthen national and regional capacity toward the application of effective multi-hazard early warning systems. Partnership and solidarity must be the foundation of our work going forward. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, señora Diane Quarles, por sus palabras. Thank you very much, Dr. Diane Quarles, for your words where you have highlighted the impact of the climate change in the and the GDP of these countries in the region. And you have also uh, said something very important, apart from the need that we have from the early warning systems, the need of solidarity, or solidarity, excuse me. And in this way, we are sh wrapping this introduction. And now we're going to go to the high-level panel titled Strengthening of those partnerships to improve the early warning systems before this multiple threats in Latin America and the Caribbean. To moderate this first panel, which since we're going to have two panels, we are have a very appreciated personality in the scientific international Latin American 
that was heading the WMO research. She's the vice pre second vice president of WMO and is also the director of the Meteorological Service in Argentina. So I believe that I must also inform that the resume, uh, uh, CVs of the panelists that are going to make part of this panel are on the website if you want to see the personality of each one of the people who are companies. Dr. Celeste Saulo, you have the floor. Good morning to all, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and good evening. We know that we are being accompanied from different time zones and different places in the world. So to all, ladies and gentlemen, it's just simply going to take some minutes of this important event. Not to repeat the things that have been mentioned already by those who have presented this report and those who have contributed with the same, because I believe that it's eloquent with what we have seen with the launching of this event. The eloquent is that the action has to be now. This report is forcing us as society, as role players, as people who are liable for the decision making to begin such action for our weather. And I would love to introduce this panel to carry out a short uh, recap of what the action means to each one of these role players and each one of the actors who are here in this event. The action, this document says that, that we need robust data, data to be able to do the decision make, and this data is being contributed by the meteorological and hydrological services. But apart from this, we also need to understand, because the data give us the evidence but do not explain the reasons or the causes. So for this reason, we need to understand the causes and to understand what ac human activities have made us look at these meteorological variables that we're measuring and these weather changes that we are reporting or registering. Uh, now we have the academia. We have science appearing as a concrete actor that summing them up with the meteorological service have a very important role. But apart from this, we also need to transfer these changes that we measure in the meteorological variables, in temperature, in humidity, in the increase of the ocean's level, and the melting of the glaciers, in these phenomena that we are perceiving in society, greater temperatures, less humidity, create droughts and fires. And here we have all the tangible impacts in the sectors, all type of sectors, productive sectors, private sector, public sector, planet housing. They're all affected by these phenomena. And we see that everything that we do in meteorological services and what the sciences are doing are impacting the sectors. Then we have the sectors with all the requirements and all their concerns and impacts. But this action that this which outcome is making in, uh, is calling us upon with this report of the weather also requires for us to understand the vulnerability of each of the systems and for us to act upon these vulnerabilities of the ecosystems of the people of the population and now we have all the communities in entering and everything is becoming more complex to such point that obviously we obviously need some coordination mechanisms, and in these coordination mechanisms, we have a very important role. Uh, the me international mechanisms have an important role within these, the World Meteorological Organization that has accompanied us in this uh, launching, like other actors like UN offices, and everybody has a roadmap to help us to tra uh, transit this action and uh, the public and private side, which each has a role, because the truth is that we do not coordinate these actions, these efforts. This would not have an effect on our job. So as I was saying, this action takes us to define and to go ahead with this adaptation and mitigation 
strategies, and this is the reason why I'm going to introduce this panel that's going to uh, concentrate this on one of these key uh, translations that we can uh, contribute with in, uh, from our office, which is our early warnings. And this way, I am going to give the floor to my dear peer, Diana, Dr. Galvin Cummins, who is the head of the Meteorological Office of the Meteorological Service in Guyana, who is accompanying us online. Garvin, it is a pleasure to have you accompanying us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President, Madam Chair. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you wherever you are. All protocols observed. I do have a short presentation. I ask our colleagues to just put it on screen. It is there. Please. Garvin, it's OK. We can see. Yes. Thank you very much. So today I want to talk a little bit about a Guyana situation. We've heard a lot on the state of the climate in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I want to talk this morning for a little bit about the state of the multi-hazard early warning system in Guyana. So a, a brief outline. The ne next slide, please brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about the common hazards in Guyana and also speak about the critical gaps in establishing a functional and effective uh, multi-hazard early warning system in Guyana. I'll talk a little bit about maximizing partnerships, and this is all in the Guyana context, and then I close with some recommendations. I rather suspect, though, that as I go through uh, the core of the status of the multi-hazard early warning system in Guyana, it might well reflect some of what is happening across uh, the countries in regional associations three and four. Next slide. So uh, Guyana has really a cycle, an annual cycle of floods across the country and drought-like conditions, especially in the southern, in the southern uh, regions of Guyana. And the most recent uh, event that we've had of significance occurred last year, actually, in 2020. The presentation is not on the screen. Okay, Garvin, it's right, okay. Can we continue now? Yes, it's okay now. Can we go to the... It's good now, yes, you can continue. The previous one, please. Thank you very much. So, right, in 2021, we had, in fact, a, a severe flooding across Guyana, uh, where all 10 administrative regions were affected. In fact, the president of Guyana did declare a national disaster because all of the regions in the country were in fact affected. Almost 30,000 households were impacted. But the difference about this particular event in 2021, the last such event we had was in 2005. The difference last year in 2021 was that all of the 10 administrative regions were in fact uh, affected to some degree. Next slide. So given all that I've said, uh, I think it's important that we examine here then what is the status of multi-hazard early warning system in Guyana. This study was actually completed. There was a gap analysis that was completed under the CRUISE initiative that allows us to really have a, a better understanding of where we are with respect to the implementation of a end-to-end people-centered multi-hazard early warning system in Guyana. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak here basically in terms of the, if you can just go up back a little bit, in terms of the four pillars for an effective early warning system. We look at the disaster risk knowledge, then detection, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of hazards and possible consequences. What is the status of warning, dissemination, and communication? And then finally, what is the status of preparedness and response capabilities? Next. So each of these themes will be uh, evaluated either from, from one to three, uh, with one being red, that the standard has not been met, yellow, the standard has been partially met, or green, or three, the standard has been fully met. Next slide. 
So starting with the first pillar, the, the, this gap analysis revealed that in Guyana, in fact, there's a lack of DRM, disaster risk management legislation. And really there is no mandate for hazard and vulner vulnerability assessments in the country. There's unclear stakeholders role within the uh, multi-hazard early warning system framework. The governance framework in place is not consistently implemented and because probably because there isn't legislation to guide the process. There's very limited risk information available and is not consolidated. So you cannot really disaggregate between gender or vulnerable groups or whatever category of uh, uh, groups you may want to put the, the risk associated with them. And then there is a limited amount of human resource capacity actually in country to conduct hazard and vulnerability assessments. So what is the score on this? So next, next please. So on this particular pillar, Diana scored just about um, partially fulfilling or reaching the standards, just about 2.1 on the scale. Next slide. Pillar number two, detection, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of hazards. So here again, we saw that there was an inadequacy in terms of the density of the observational network. It really did not even, uh, in terms of what we're talking about on the GBON, did not reach what is required for a basic net network. There's weak uh, monitoring and reporting of impacts across the country. I need to say that Guyana, for those of you who may not know, 90% uh, of the population or thereabout lives just along the coastal belt. And that region is also covered by proper uh, forms of communication. However, the other 90% of the country is sparsely populated where a lot of the indigenous population occupies and inhabits. So there's also, um, there's a not, there's, there isn't in country right now a national flood early warning system that is fully operationalized. In 2021, we did in fact have the, the, the general framework installed as a system that has to be built. There is limited access to warning and forecasting services, especially again for those vulnerable indigenous communities. And messages are generally prepared and disseminated in a very generali generalized form, not necessarily being tailored for specific uh, groups of people or stakeholders. And then again, as I said before, the, the, the roles are poorly defined. Next slide. So on, on, on this particular pillar, Guyana again, uh, partially met the standard requirements for a multi-hazard early warning system. Next slide. Pillar number three, uh, limited warning, the gaps here again, limited early warning communication systems, as I would have described before, not necessarily um, any way to evaluate where the messages are received and how people are responding to the messages. The alert system is, is, is very generic and uh, does not cover all of the possible hazards that we have in Ghana, uh, specifically restricted to rainfall amounts. And there is no uh, clear communication protocols in place, for example, who does what, when, where, what are the responsibilities for the different uh, levels at the community level, the regional level, that is not clearly defined. And there's a need to scale up general uh, public awareness and education on disaster risk. Next. So uh, here we see that Guyana scored even lower. So the standards have not been met with respect to this uh, pillar, pillar number three. Next slide. And the final pillar, uh, preparedness and response capabilities. So we have a very outdated disaster response plan dated over 10 years now. There's low, there are low levels of uh, practice and awareness on the plans themselves. Often uh, the persons who would know about them are the persons who probably would have worked on the plans and is not disseminated downwards. DRM is not in our currently in our school curriculum. And finally, um, there's limited public announcements to Im improve public understanding and awareness on DRM. So next, on this particular pillar, the score again was extremely low. The standard was not met. So having said all of this now, I'd like to move to the next slide. Uh, to really show that overall, uh, looking at all of the pillars here, Guyana would have scored just about uh, 1.6, which means that the standards are not met in general with respect to having an effective and people-centered multi-hazard early warning system. So next slide. So having said all of that, I think the report there was pretty bleak, but I think that in spite of the lack of a, a formal system in place, uh, there's a recognition that partnerships and institutional coordination are in fact critical to effective disaster response. So while many of these things are not formalized with the legislation or the necessary institutional structure, the partnerships, there are, are opportunities for partnerships. There is in fact 
in existence at the national, regional, and community level arrangements which facilitate coordinated disaster response. There's a National Emergency Operations Center, which is activated as required, but coordinating all of the work across the country with respect to, with respect to disaster risk reduction is a National Disaster Risk Reduction Coordinating Coordination Platform, which really is a multi-stakeholder body that um, works together across sectors. The, public, the private sector is uh, represented, the public sector, academia as well, and NGO civil societies on this. Recently, we have a, a nascent oil and gas industry, and a coordination mechanism has been put in place for, to facilitate response in that area as well. At the, community, at the regional level, there are also disaster risk management committees, and then at, at there are community-based uh, risk management committees as well that are activated. Next slide. So uh, communication is, uh, is recognized as a key uh, element in any disaster response between government and the general population. And in this case, there's strong partnerships between government and the government agencies and the telecommunication companies allowing for messages to be transmitted for, to allow for relief and evacuation, et cetera, and other uh, response operations. Partnerships have, are also essential to bridging the existing gaps, as I would have described earlier. And the private sector, in fact, plays a very important role in Guyana, even though it is not formalized in terms of disaster response, evacuation, uh, the trans transport of relief, or even the, the, the supply of relief for many communities across the country. The, public, the private sector does, in fact, play a major, major role in terms of ensuring that the response is effective and efficient. There are a lot of uh, uh, civil society organizations as well as, as churches that, and, uh, that, that may uh, provide shelters, that may provide counseling. NGOs also provide uh, shelter management services and goods, such as the Guyana Red Cross Society. And there are also lots of local NGOs that um, provide initial damage assessment and response. And there are also development, developmental partners that provide uh, key services. For example, in 2021, we had some good uh, partnerships with uh, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, UNITAR, UNISAT, that allows us to map those areas that are in fact affected by the floods. Next slide. So I'm gonna wrap up here now by just making some quick recommendations on what I think um, can actually help to improve partnerships and to ensure that coordination is in place to allow us to effectively respond and prepare for, for, for disasters. So the first one I have there is to really map your all the stakeholders, all the potential partners in times of calm. So when there's an event, we, we know uh, all of our partners, we know what their capacities are, we know how they can contribute to the response activity. It might be also useful to establish uh, cooperation agreements or MOUs with some of these partners to formalize these relationships. And thirdly, um, training and skill building in periods of calm are also essential to allow us to respond in times of disaster so that we can be at our best as we respond to particular uh, disasters. And finally, I think in our case especially, there's a need to reform the legislative environment to ensure that all parties are on board and roles and responsibilities are clearly defined and we understand what our roles would be well in advance of any particular event. And finally, I think there might be some opportunity as well of finding ways, don't know that I have the answer, but there might be some ways to incentivize some of these relationships to ensure that persons come on board so that we can be effective in our disaster response. But I'm sure I think that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. That is my time. Much. Muchas gracias a ti, Garvin, por los puntos, porque... Thank you, Garvin, for your points, because you commented on your points, on your problems, but also alternatives. So I'm going to give the word now to Mr. Raúl Salazar, who is with us uh, presentially. Thank you for being with us. Mr. Salazar is the director of the regional office of U United Nations for the reduction of, ri of risk of disaster and is co-president of the Coalition of United Nations for Climate and Resilience. Uh, dear Raul, uh, you have the floor. I ask you please to adjust to the times so for all speakers. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. For this invitation to share with you the, these uh, reflections on um, the appreciation of what we've been doing in terms of early alert multi-risk systems. Only to point out that the Sendai framework, when it was adopted, included, as you know, an important component uh, aside of the four priorities of the framework that point out to advance in governance of risk, knowledge of the risk, uh, uh, resilient investment and reconstruction, or build back better. It also included seven goals that were adopted by the countries, among which we have the goal, the G goal, that refers to advancing and implementing systems, uh, early alert multi-risk systems. And if you observe what are the components of this goal, it's not only aspirations, but also there's some concrete commitments we adopted by part of the General Assembly uh, a set of indicators in regarding early alert. There's six indicators, five of which refer essentially to how we're advancing and implementing the systems, and a sixth indicator that refers to the capacity of evacuating the population on the base of these alerts. And if you first observe how we've advanced as a region, in the implementation of these systems, we can do it through the monitoring system of the framework of Sendai, which was approved, through which countries report their advances. And you can see that our region, only 17 of 35 countries in the region are reporting having at least being in process of reporting on these advances, and only seven of 35 countries have reported, implemented these early alert multi-risk systems, at least by 2021. So what we're proposing at the, end, at the beginning of this report that was launched today, it's quite clear in the sense that there's existing important gaps in advancing and implementing these systems in our region, which uh, makes us reflect on the need of continuing with this strengthening of capacities of the countries to have these systems in place and not only implement them, but also that allow monitoring of how they are advancing with regards to this goal and commitment. A second reflection, the first one is how we're doing. The second is what are the main challenges that we can face and why we're not advancing like we would like to, why we find these gaps. We see that in the case of the region, as the, the rest of the world, uh, we are facing a context of risks more complex, more interconnected, and we've seen this clearly in COVID-19, where there's a coexistence of risks, not only climate, but also biological, induced by the human beings, and those that are uh, are geological, like it happened in the Caribbean islands. This takes us to make an approximation, uh, uh, a very sectorized, uh, where this information does not flow, and maybe the risks uh, are only faced by one sector or one type of risks, but what we see is that even governance systems are designed to face risks essentially from nature, but not necessarily those linked or that come simultaneously from the humans. So alert, multi-threat alert systems 
uh, have a systemic approach to risk so we so that they are approached by intersectors not only by the government but different uh, sectors to be able to be effective the different mandates of agencies respond to specific directives of each sector and this uh, creates difficulties for the coordinated efforts that are needed and this also calls for a first action which is basically how we phase the preparation of plans and national strategies for risk disaster risk reduction that integrates different aspects of risks that uh, call for multi-sector uh, how do we create a legislation that defines the coordination mechanisms and define the different roles of the actions we saw this in the Guyana presentation where one of the main limitations was the definition of roles by sector and also uh, the budget aspects to see how much is assigned. Sometimes we see that the multi-alert systems are based on projects, not necessarily financed uh, consistently as part of the public budget. And this has to do with legislation. However, there's important experiences. Trinidad and Tobago, we saw recently they have a system where this type of reflections happens intersectorial, for example, uh, early alert. And getting to the last point of this coalition, the system on sp specific issues of United N Nations that is oriented to providing a, a vision that is multi-sectorial, where the capacities of different United Nations agencies participate, is 14 organizations participating in this coalition of resilience and climate change, where these aspects are faced from food security, not only climate, also uh, impacts on childhood, displacement, climate aspects, and this uh, is seek through on the counseling through, through. So we produce a series of products that are the disposition of teams to facilitate the implementation and country agreements, this type of focus. Uh, thank you, Raul, for your contributions. And I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Uh, Nicole Glinich. She's a specialist in risk management fr from the Caribbean, and she's online with us. Nicole, you have the floor. Please remember uh, to, ke to keep within the time of five minutes. Thank you very much. We can hear you. Hi, Nicole. Okay, excellent. I would like to share my screen. Please go ahead. I'm not allowed. Can you share the screen? Yes, I can now. Are you seeing the presentation on the screen? Yes, we can see it. Excellent. So, hello to you, wherever, whatever time it is in the world, all protocols being established. I'm happy to be here today to present to you on behalf of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. Are you seeing my, my screen in full view? Full presentation mode? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Sudima um, is made up of 20 participating states. Um, you can see we have the Bahamas in the north, and coming all the way down, we have Suriname, and then right across, we have Belize and then the Eastern Caribbean chain. Um, 
Guyana is also a participating state of Sudima, and um, I will make some connections between my presentation and the presentation given by Mr. Cummings. Um, I'm going to speak to Sudima initiatives that are related to multi-hazard early warning systems. We have a number of those initiatives, and our work is really buttressed within the Comprehensive Disaster Management Strategy 2040 to 2024. And on the priority area four, which speaks to community resilience, you will see that there is a priority outcome area related to community early warning systems being integrated, improved, and expanded. Our work, um, which is the blueprint here on comprehensive disaster management, is aligned to the Sendai framework. What has Sedima been doing? Well, we've been focusing um, on developing the appropriate guidance documents for the to aid our participating states. So we have developed the model multi-hazard early warning systems policy um, or, and early warning systems toolkit. Um, through the use of, of, of these tools, we are seeking to build up the enabling environment in our participating states. We've also taken on work of um, implementing what we call the six-step process for developing evidence-based roadmaps in participating states, whereby we establish a supporting structure or arrangement that would provide oversight to the work. Then there's the application of the multi-hazard early warnings checklist, which Mr. Cummings would have shared. We prepare then the gap analysis report. That is then verified. The roadmap is prepared as part of a workshop. And then the next step is the implementation of what is in the roadmap. We are able to do this work only through the support of our partners, including the United Nations Development Program, work with the World Bank recently um, through the CRUISE project to help us to reach more of our participating states with this work. So on our, on our website, you will see we have an early warning systems toolkit that would provide the tools and guidance on each of the pillars of, of multi-hazard early warning systems. The, the policy, I've just shared it here, but that is built out based on the early warning systems pillars, the enabling environment being key to that, and having the guiding principles in place. Um, so this is just a look at the checklist, and it comes a very good job explaining how that was applied in the Guyana context. We had applied prior to 2021 in Guyana, we had applied it in 2020, 2018 in other participating states of Sigma, also in collaboration with other partners. In 2021, we did it in Guyana. We applied that in Guyana, in Barbados, and also in another participating state. I will just highlight there, Trinidad and Tobago. We were able then to do imp make improvements to the checklist, the 2021 version, where we now have this one, two, three, um, a team level. So, we prepared a regional summary work team that we're able to look at our countries, seven of them that would have applied the checklist and be able then to understand where the trends in our participating states and to take this to the other participating states to see if they can verify that this is similar in their um, situation as well. So these are the, the gap analysis reports that we prepared in 2021 and then the roadmaps that came out or those three countries that I mentioned. So what were the findings? We recognize that we have issues with having risk information being available in our states, having a data sharing, um, data sharing um, protocols and re repositories, um, the normative frameworks, we have gaps in that area. And then these four other areas where we have um, shortfalls in tests and exercises, um, the community level is uh, an engagement across the pillars is limited. Um, consideration the needs of the vulnerable, respect for gender, and so on. We have gaps in these areas. There's sporadic testing, a perpetual lack of awareness of respective roles and responsibilities as um, came up in the case of Guyana. But across the board, this is also the case. And there are concerns around the alert system, including redundancy in the systems, maintaining the communication channels, and disseminating to reach the last mile. Um, finally, just to highlight on the human resource constraints, um, there is a lot of overwork due to limited staffing and the need for technical capacity and resources to effectively undertake duties. Um, 
across the board, though, sustainable funding is lamented in all our participating states, and the, the, the limitations in the technical capacity is a perpetual challenge. So therefore, then, what are the priorities that we have seen um, emerging from these checklists? Well, of course, the need to have the hazard vulnerability and state and analysis. Um, the need to update and enact legislation um, to guide and also standard operating procedures. Um, Sedema is also, um, with the help of the cruise project, we're now working on SOPs between the disaster management offices and the Met offices. Um, but we need to do more in this area. Um, there's also the technical training to be done, um, increasing the frequency of our communication um, campaigns, um, have, having better communication, whereby we have better reach and, and target, and we reach our target audiences. And also the fact that we need to have standardized methodologies, data sharing protocols, and increased test and exercise. As you can see, these are tied to the gaps that I have identified. So just very quickly to wrap up then on um, recommendations and way forward from a regional perspective. Um, we do have in the report a lot more detailed recommendations also for at the national level. But given the focus for today in terms of promoting coordination and integration of efforts related to multi hazard for warning systems, um, currently for the region, um, under the cruises, there's the um, strategic roadmap for advancing multi-hazard early warning systems. What we would like to see there is that we revisit some of the design assumptions there to determine whether the lack of minimum threshold foundation as the EWS architecture, where countries don't have legislation, they don't have policies, um, appropriate policies in place, and then they don't have that data um, that would be available, that we need to revisit those key assumptions and try and address those causes. Some of them take longer than others to address, but we really need to get to the root and address those um, so that we can identify the critical path and priority activities at the national level and see how we support those at the regional level. Um, we do have a number of states, like I said, this work was done in seven countries, um, but we have 20 participating states and we have um, shortfalls in terms of how are we going to um, finance that work in the other participating states where we need to have the evidence base in place. Um, multiple agencies and donors are actively engaging and supporting improvements in the multi-hazard early warning systems work. Um, and we also have a regional early warning systems consortium, but we, we need to coordinate better. And so as it relates to this regional early warning systems, which has the role of um, pursuing the articulation of standards um, they have a role in, in, in providing and coordinating EWS in the region. This consortium, um, we have had challenges in convening, convening it due to a um, lot of staffing challenge, um, the limited human resources to keep it pushing along. But we were able to establish this group that is Sedema, and it is made up of those key partners in early warning systems in the region. And of course, we can improve in terms of who is engaged but we need, to, as a group, to break the barriers. There's certainly a role for the group in breaking the barriers to data flows within and between countries and articulating regional standards so that we can streamline systems, approaches, and interoperability. Uh, finally, then, as we look to sustainable Nicole. finance, then we can leverage Nicole. the strategic roadmap can to, you hear to me? give us a coherent approach to, to that. We can also ensure that we have used the national and regional roadmap as a mechanism for attracting investment, transparency, and accountability in the evolution, in the evolution of MUSE. Um, creating a pooled regional fund is another suggestion, and also to ensure that our national disaster offices, in cooperation with diverse partners, develop those private-public um, um, partnerships. So I thank you for listening, okay. and I'm... Um, happy if there's any questions at the appropriate time. Over. Thank you very much, Nicole. Gracias. Thank you, Nicole. Unfortunately, we have very short time uh, for questions. We thank you for your experience. And now I give the word to Ana Maria Bogdanova. She's a specialist in risk management and catastrophes, and she works at the World Bank. Uh, dear Anna, it's a pleasure to be with you today. You have the floor. Uh, please adjust to the five minutes. 
Thank you very much, Jule. Thank WMO and the colleagues for organizing this discussion and launching the report that provides very rich evidence for the need for more actions. And I understand we're way be behind those schedules. So it's not easy to be the last one to talk because a lot of points have been made by now. So use my intervention as a summary in a way. So um, maybe just also a disclaimer that my work is mostly focused on the Caribbean region and Central America. So my comments would mostly be applicable to these areas. However, I believe that the lessons learned there are very much applicable across the region. So speaking of challenges, a lot has been said already, but I'd like to just maybe reiterate that when we talk about multi-hazard early warning services and systems, we should look at it um, at, in the regional and national context. So we're talking about the region that is highly vulnerable to increasing climate vulnerability and extremes due to climate change. We heard from the message of Secretary General that we have heat extremes and changing precipitation patterns and agricultural productivity is impacted and hydrological regimes are changing. So you have from shrinking glaciers to increasing uh, sea level rise that could generate millions and hundreds of millions um, of losses um, in pretty much every area of the region. We also dealing with the changing pattern of frequency and intensity of events. So the hurricane season of 2020 brought two hurricanes that were hitting Central America in less than two weeks, uh, causing tens of billions of dollars of damage. Uh, 2020 first was the third most active um, hurricane season. Now we're looking at above normal intensity. Again, um, the Climate change is already having a major impact on the growth in, in Latin American and Caribbean regions. So on average, about 1.7% of GDP is lost each year due to climate change-related disasters. And several countries are experiencing deeper, longer droughts and intensified storms and floods and are disrupting economies, activities, and affecting livelihoods. Uh, so when we are in the context when we have struggling economies, growing inequality, increasing fiscal constraints, all this will have a direct impact on the multi-hazard early warning systems and vice versa. So I think it's important to always have this on the radar and to have this context in mind when we talk about challenges and effectiveness of multi-hazard early warning systems. We say that, that the systems should be fit for purpose, they should be fit for actions, but they also have to be fit for national budgets. So we have to keep this in mind, and we may expect that climate change will lead up to 300% increase in extreme poverty in Latin America by 2030. These people are in many ways on the front line that we need to keep this in mind when we talk about their lives and how, how the effective and inclusive multi-hazard early, uh, early warning services looks like. So this is way much more than the hydrometal networks question. And um, when we say effective multi-hazard early warning services, and it means very often a sustainable uh, uh, early warning service. So sustainability is another key concept that we're constantly referring to, but we need to constantly break it down to smaller pieces to better understand what we mean when we say sustainable. So it's sustainability of the network, hardware, maintenance. On the other hand, it's sustainability of training and education of staff, funding and cost, communication. Yeah. Very often, it's sustainability of motivation of people in communities and those who liaise with communities. Um, and if we look for the opportunities, they very often come from uh, from from the challenges. So uh, maybe just to summarize that, and I and I heard it throughout the presentations of my colleagues, strong political commitments, which would then support a stronger policy and regulatory environment, legislative support for harmonized approach is essential to streamline integrity in uh, per, sorry, um, interagency data sharing and develop crucial applications and modeling for, for example, for IBF transition. Policy and legislative support are crucial for expansion to private sector collaboration along with, with, with the entire early warning service value chain. Um, we very often, um, we, we need to kind of like understand what are the regional and national institutions and what are their capacities. So regional national leadership is crucial for the successful performance of the multi-hazard early warning services, which will require collaboration and resourcing at international, regional, and national levels. Capacity building. Capacity building has become kind of like a catch-all phrase that is used almost automatically every time we talk about multi-stakeholder systems. Capacity building underpins institutional development and the human resources, and it requires the constant support and injections. Um, 
And uh, I, I think just maybe to add that the private sector and the academia are playing, uh, have to be integrated in the whole concept of multi hurricane early warning system and when it's built and when it's become effective and when it's assessed. Um, I probably don't have to advocate for partnerships and make any any more arguments in favor. Uh, just to add uh, that for the Cruise Caribbean project, it was in general a product of the partnership between the WMO, UNDRR, and the bank. And we found that it's very important to transform the partnership from overall support and information sharing to actual collaboration. So it's critical to find these two or three areas where you're really going to join the efforts and make a difference. It doesn't have to be super grandiose. It can be something very practical and, and which may look like small scale, but in fact, it brings a lot of value. And I think like a Cruise Caribbean project was a good example because we were partnering with CDMA for early warning checklists for several countries. We're constantly working hand in hand with CMO headquarters and CMH for several pilots and partnering with other programs like Weather Ready Nations program to support the transition to the impact-based forecasting. So I'm wrapping up maybe just two last comments saying that um, the case for the need for the multi-hazard early warning system has been made. So next is to help each other and to help countries to develop multi-hazard systems that work, that trigger actions, to understand why people are taking actions or why they're not taking actions and how we can change this. How do we link the effectiveness of multi-hazard early warning systems with building back better costs, for example, and more? So it is a it is a transition to the action side, to the impact side, and I think that gives us a lot of a lot of tasks and a lot of uh, our to-do list is growing. Um, I'm wrapping up. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ana Maria. Uh, this applause was also for Nicole that we did not give her an applause. An applause as well for everyone who is contributing to this panel. And I am going to give the floor to with the, uh, the host of this meeting so we continue with the activity since we are a little bit behind on the agenda. Andres, uh, good morning, Celeste. We would like to thank the moder moderator and the panelists of this first segment. Now we're going to go to the second part. We have a second and last panel. We have the privilege to come with Dr. Arlene Lane, the coordinator director of the Meteorological Caribbean organization that will comply with, uh, that will be the moderator for the second segment online from Trinidad and Tobago. So I will give the floor to Ms. Lane. Go ahead, please. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Buenos dias. Everyone, with all protocols being observed, I greet you on behalf of the 16 member states of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, which extends from Belize in the west to Guyana in the east. Thank you for inviting me to chair this high-level panel to address the critical role of national meteorological and hydrological services and the research community in strengthening multi-hazard early warning systems in our region. The panel will focus on ensuring that innovations in science our transition to operations and um, services for early warning systems, and for the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services to in turn influence and inspire researchers to conduct studies in their priority areas of need. The WMO Research Board's concept notes on science for services and innovations in regions highlight some of the best practices in how operational and research communities can work together with Latin America and the Caribbean being among those who contributed to those concept notes and also the role of all of these groups working together with the WMO research programs that are being conducted um, with activities across the globe. These research operations and operations to research dialogues collaborations, they rely on data sharing and a multidisciplinary research approach, as well as training within MET and HydroMet services to become more research oriented. All of these take considerable efforts to be successful. Our panel of speakers will be, um, whom I'll be introducing shortly, will provide some of those examples to us for our region. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jose Marengo, 
Research and Development Director of Semeda, Semadeng, I apologize, and lead author of the WMO Climate Report for Latin America and the Caribbean 2021. Dr. Marengo, I give you the floor. Okay, well, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good morning, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to present something that is on the experience that we have in Brazil in regards to the multi-hazard or early warning systems, which our monitoring center is the early natural disasters um, center for the federal government. As so we do forecasting, we do hydrometeorological uh, origin. A lot of water can give place to floodings. And these uh, strong floodings in the case of landslides and also the droughts. We do not make uh, forecasting of time. We use, we use it as a guide for those hazards to try to mitigate those risks that disasters bring. So that is the early warning system. So just to say that MLM was created in 2011 after a disaster that occurred in the Rio de Janeiro Serrana side where more than 1,000 people passed away. Well, here is where through the federal government, uh, disaster early warning is not one for meteorology. It can be one for meteorology in a region, but where it rains, where there's people, but there can be disasters. Yes. Where there's a high concentration of people, and as the case of the region of uh, northeast all the way to the south. So this attribution of Semadén, when it was created, we did not think much um, of being a multi-hazard early warning system. It was just to answer to those needs that we have to take action to avoid people to continue dying throughout every year in winter and summers. And this one, we created this in 2011. And then with the Sendai protocol in 2015, well, we more or less adjusted it so we can fit it into the news system. So in Brazil, the governance for these natural disasters, so for example, we uh, put Amadem as a federal government center, a research center that is applicable and for, of, and operate, uh, of, for the application of the, uh, to manage the risk of this disaster. So as Amadem, gathers all the information from all the other centers from Alina Med, which is a meter National Meteorological Hydrological Center, the, the private sector as well. And then we also have information from what it refers to the part of population, capabilities or capacities of income and all these things that uh, determines vulnerability in the general meteorological service in Brazil that allows us to see the exposition of these people and the National Agency for Waters and as well as the communities of the, the contribution of population together with the academic centers. We have other investigations at a national and international level. So after all this, gathering all this information, the CIMA then went for, to elaborate or create these warnings through uh, a team of people that includes meteorologists, hydrologists, geographers, geologists, excuse me, specialists in communication, specialists in national disasters and human rights. And we pass this to Senat, which is the National Center for Disaster, and the Senat passed it to the Defensa Civil, the civil defense. So we issued a warning, the CIMA then, uh, looks at it and then they pass it to the defense series. So who is the one that takes the actions to they're the ones who take the action to evacuate those people and the risk management would be the defense civil. Say Marel does not issue those alerts to the population. It's through the defense civil. And of course the defense civil will take all the contingency actions for work, for all the recovery actions. Here I will give you two examples that we have very intense rains in the last weeks of December in 2021 within the Bahia states and Minas Gerais. With these, uh, during these weeks, we had more than 200, 300 millimeters of rain greater than the normal, above the normal. So of course, this created a great risk of floods, of intense ones, and these warnings were passed to population. It was not looked uh, because of, of time, because the meteorologists 
already had done the forecasting of time. What they gave us in the information was the warning of the disaster or the occurrence or the risk of disasters for these occurrences of the strong disasters. And this basically took us the number of people who passed away was relatively low. It was only 26. So here is it where we have to see that these considerations of monitoring, of early warnings, also help the population to reduce the number of fatalities as much as possible. So this was last year and just recently. This comes from the issued warnings, and the first map shows us the risk hydrological maps in December, and the second map were the recurrences of what happened. So here, I don't know if you can see this uh, set of maps. It's just the rain that was accumulated in the last week, the, from the 23rd to the 27th of December. Here in the image down at the bottom, we have those lines that represent those recurrences, and those bars represent the alerts so or the warnings. So what we basically, I don't know if I can just uh, point this here, what I'm pointing is the alert or the warning that we issued, and then we had the phenomenon occurring two days later. So it was a warning one way or another. Another case where we also had uh, something happen, the situation was not so favorable, was in the state of Recife the metropolitan Recife area, which is a population of almost a million point six people. And in May, and the 25th and 28th of May, as a consequence of these eastern waves, the meteorological institutions did a forecasting of rain. The only thing was that they, it rained more than was foreseen. The alerts were issued, as you can see in the bottom map, the first map of the metropolitan Politan Recife area where we have those red and brown stains. These are the vulnerable areas. Those areas that were identified just with those uh, geological, uh, meteorological services from the uh, statistic geography um, center of this data where they have a high intensity of population where the houses are one beside the next one. And well, unfortunately, these disasters occurred. Then we can see the other numbers or it rained a lot more in these areas where we have those circles that are the vulnerable areas. So what is it that happened? Well, with these issued uh, or, or emitted warnings were high, 133, and this is where we realized that we're still missing or lacking one way or another, the training to population one way or another in the governments as well, these governments of the state to be able to have this perception that when we emit an alert or issue an alert or a warning, even if it's not true, we must take those necessary actions. So bueno, había un slide basically. there was a slide at the end basically, excuse me, I apologize. I believe I'm gonna have to give you my back. So we just added some important questions. For example, the risk that all these events, critical events are increasing, and then we have something that says that we must think of investigating to know the risk, quantify this one, monitor this risk, just for the population and, to the, and for the government to be prepared, not particularly with those people who are living these risk areas. So in some cases, like the case that I was speaking about in the Minas Gerais, when we did the forecasting of the hazard the, uh, for the rain, we also issued the uh, early warnings uh, considering some events and some information that are not meteorological, that are basically of the, the census of topography of these populations. So to be able to understand a risk for a disaster is not a meteorology is not enough is to have the knowledge of vulnerability and the population of this area where the rain is going to be falling. So in the last case, the meteorological services, and in this case, Muse, in the case of Brazil, we work together because, well, with the information that we have, we must have other data, the idea of support and the meteorological service and hydrological service, as well as the idea to interact among the operational sector of these state and federal services, just as with the federal government and with those centers that work with forecasting and warnings, 
is quite intense. So there's a lot of research and there's, of course, a lot of money involved in this. Suma then has their own network that we join in with the observation networks and then we can do um, more intense monitoring of these areas that were particularly affected. We do a thousand to 200 uh, municipalities that are more vulnerable for disasters and so with this, I wanted to give you an overview on the center where I work in. Uh, this is not propaganda, it's just so a multi-hazard early warning system that was not founded for this, but we're helping with it. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, doctor. It's good to see this example of, of the, the, all of these groups working together across disciplines in order to ensure a successful multi-hazard early warning system. I would like to now introduce our next panelist. That is um, engineer Yolanda Gonzalez, director of IDAM and president of Regional Association 3. Ms. Gonzalez, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Muy buenos días, buenas tardes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are accompanying us in person and virtually, and for those who will be listening to us in the reproduction of this great meeting. As president of the Regional Association, AR3 South America, we would like to bring to, the, uh, to you and to acknowledge all those research needs, the research for investig uh, or for South America guided towards the climate and Earth, as it was presented by Dr. Dallas and Dr. Wayan. These needs for research in South America aimed at the uh, ecosystems, Earth, and weather association in our and the end, Amazon's marine, coastal, insular, and hydrological, and these trans uh, borders, uh, systems, genders, and communities. Those data policies and the data as being a main piece, the main idea of the climatology, uh, met meteorology, and hydrological uh, system through our training systems in WMO with CINMER, acad public academia, and the private academia, with agreements of um, from all the parties where, uh, by means of these, we'll be able to implement those regional plans lined with the strategic plan from WMO. We know and we're aware of the reduction of relief from the National Meteorological Service, not only in AR3, but also in the great part of the planet. Is This information is rewarding, the knowledge and the research is also rewarding. Hand by hand with technology, the application, integral or comprehensive ap application of all the new technologies that have come to innovate us and to inform us and to give us another push, the development of softwares and platforms that would allow us to have as an initiative uh, basis like CISA in the drought topic. For us in AR3, it is necessary and rewarding to do the research on droughts and as well as those studies for the weather behavior in the high mountains and in the Amazons. Projects as Nandas Braves and Nandes Plus as well, as well as communication with the community and society. For this, we are proposing the ART, AR3, for the strengthening of the expert groups with those partnerships from the academia around the research of global warming and the viability of these weather and stream events, and as we have seen today, those waves of heat or cold weather in the national regional plants in WMO. We would also like to share with you a great piece of news that we have been developing, motivated by Mr. Wayan, around the early warning systems, early actions, this initiative from the AR3 that has been driven by WMO in Geneva and 
together with all the PRs and all the instances that we have heard today from the United Nations in the creation or generation of a early warnings center for Latin America or our early warning system for South America. This initiative that is unique for the planet given that we have these instances as it was cited before by, for this early warning systems or softwares projects or experiences that are so valuable as has been shown today and this rewarding need and the only opportunity that we have in this moment in South America to create this early warning system for uh, Latin America around all the meteorological, environmental, hydrological systems like bushfires, floodings, floodings, heat waves, heat, uh, cold or, or weather waves, and we have the uh, coastal erosion, the coastal component, and all these things that affect us in the insular uh, zones, all these participation uh, events and things that happen in the cities. These are not new challenges in the quality of air in the environmental components and the quality of air in our urban zones, as well as sharing that this initiative counts with the motivation of the PRs and as well as those experiences that we have had in several countries in Latin America. And we wanted to share these initiatives that we're sure we will be presenting very soon in those scenarios that will allow us to favor the fin financing and the management of this one, of the same. Uh, work with Latin American is something that we're going to do join with our five groups, work groups with the presidents, vice presidents, who I would like to thank and congratulate for all the permanent work that you carry out for the regional American of Office of the Americas. And we would like to thank WMO for this joint work that we have been developing in AR3. And as it was said by the Minister of Environment, Dr. Carlos Correa, early warning action, early actions, I believe that this meeting and in this moment, we're beginning to have this system for Latin America that we will all be strengthening and building and sustaining as well, the sustainability for this system. Thank you very much. Is for those words and your leadership of Regional Association 3. I would like now to pass the floor on to Mr. Evan Thompson, who is the director of the Jamaican Meteorological Service, as well as the president of Regional Association 4. Thank you very much, Arlene, and a very good day to all of you who are in the room and those who are joining us on the online virtual platform. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming in late to bat here. Um, we're, we're almost at the end of our forum, but uh, you know, Jamaicans are known to be very fast, so I think I will have no problems this morning. <laughs> we will be able to get through my slides in a very short period of time. But I wanted to look back at the, the fact that Regional Association 4 in our 18th session in 2021, we took a number of decisions, and some of these were expressed in the vision of the RA4 with respect to research. So I do want to inform you about the research um, priorities that we do have in our region. It was said earlier that multi-hazard early warning systems are essential for effective adaptation to weather and climate extremes. But it's important to recognize that research is important for the development of these multi-hazard early warning systems. First of all, to identify what the problems are that we want to address. And then, of course, as we address those problems, to make sure that we have the ideal solutions for the problems. So in our decisions, we, we, we decided that we would promote the convergence and integration between the WMO research programs of interest to our region within and outside of the WMO community. There were a number of other decisions having to do, of course, with disaster risk reduction and um, multi-hazard early warning systems. But we also decided to engage with the research board of the WMO to coordinate the execution of the WMO research programs according to the priorities that were established in our regional association. We also decided to develop a roadmap that would coordinate or that is coordinated by the focal point on research and modeling to address these research priorities within the active participation of WMO-sponsored programs, universities, research entities, and scientific partner organizations. 
we had a number of research priorities, and there were also a number of activities that were identified. So I just want to point to a few of these in my presentation. First of all, we decided our, our research priority was to coordinate or to contribute to the development of high resolution, subseasonal and seasonal numerical weather prediction models implemented in the Central America region and based on the outputs of the global forecasting system, the GFS. Under the topic of climate variability and change, climate extremes, compo compound events, and climate change related issues, including impacts on agriculture, health, wildfires, water, etc., those were also considered priority activities to be undertaken. Under hydrology, we thought about the coastal and inland flooding, improving quality quantitative precipitation estimation. Also in marine areas, the development of high resolution probabilistic coastal inundation modeling guidance and products. There were also priorities identified concerning atmospheric composition, but also we looked at some specific activities that we would be engaging going forward. And included in those are the enhancing of efforts to obtain funding, which is critical to research and building of partnerships with research institutions. Also a focus on transitioning scientific knowledge to operations and services. Then we also decided that there was the important activity of embracing and empowering um, decision makers through co-design and the incorporation of social science research. Um, so that is something that we thought was very important that we needed to move forward on. The RA4 and of course our focal point for research and modeling um, also looked at strengthening of the science research relationship and the multi-hazard early warning systems. So uh, under this, we identified, we have been identifying scientists within our RA4 who can support operational activities following the WMO research to services approach and serve to WMO research working groups. Also, our focal point is fostering activities and events that are relevant to RA4 research priorities and the multi-hazard early warning system, such as the workshops on lightning research, applications, and safety awareness. Quite often overlooked, but we recognize it as very important. Also, knowledge action network on emergent risks and extreme events. So that's basically it. I told you I would be quick. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson, um, for highlighting the research priorities of RE4 and um, how are some of these priorities are being implemented. And um, the linkage, of course, with the WMO Research Board and the WMO Research Programs and those long-term goals that those um, projects are fulfilling. I would like to now introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Jorge Tamayo, who is the coordinator for the Iberio American Meteorological Cooperation Program. Dr. Tamayo, you have the floor, please. Eh, muchas gracias. Bueno, buenos días, eh, buenas... Good afternoon and good morning to all of you. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me in representation of CIMET. This is the conference of directors of meteorological services is the network that meteorology that encompasses all the Spanish-speaking community. This network constitutes a collaboration forum between different directors to propose activities that allow to fulfill objectives, which are providing services to society, and among those objectives, priority is everything to do with early alert. We've commented several times that these systems of early alert with phenomena that has to do with hydrometeorological events, and also new challenges happening correlated to atmospherical problems with those that have to do with quality air quality. This means we have uh, challenges to be able to provide these services to society. 
with a series of problems. We're not going to get into this um, with respect to the capacity of the meteorological services, but there's a fundamental element which is being having tools available that allow us to provide the services. And this is where the collaboration with scientific community uh, should support these meteorological services, these institutions, so to be able to choose systems and tools that can go to operational and explain the phenomena. Also, the network shows us a big difference between the research community and the meteorological community. The first one has the objective of the most uh, theoretical part of knowledge. They work based on projects financed that have some specific th uh, or theoretical objectives, um, which while the meteorological services have to do with operability, having direct information available. So in principle, they work differently, these two communities, but they have to work in a complementary way. We are two sectors that are de condemned to be, to understand each other. So if the projects don't have a final application, a clear application, they have no sense. And, and we cannot also take advantage of these products. So we must propose to collaborate closely and develop design projects from the start with the two communities involved, not like it occurs a lot of the times that projects are already going on underway and then we talk. But we should talk from the beginning um, continuously. Uh, there's always problems, especially from the me meteorological services by because of personnel. Normally we don't have enough qualified personnel to be able to collaborate actively with universities or research community in general. Sometimes we have administrative problems to be able to present a project There's with the different components, the doctors, the researchers have to be doctors and we don't have people with PhDs sometimes. So we might have problems related to being able to advance. I believe this is an issue that can be solved and must be solved in time. If really this problem, this lack of doctors or doctorate candidates could be an opportunity. We can establish um, collaborations to develop theses uh, focused on solving the problems of a meteorological service in terms of numerical modeling, diffusion, and not forgetting also about the social sector. Uh, sociology uh, is n not taking into account in these projects. We all, always think about physics, climatology, but really uh, sociological aspects are fundamental. So that's important in an alert system. The important part is evidently is do it, but also to get to people. If that information does not get to people in a usable way by different sectors, the society in general, well, it's worthless. So an important part of how we transmit information is one of the fundamental elements when we establish collaboration with the research community and the meteorological services. And to close, CIMED, this network, how can it collabor collaborate? Fundamentally, supporting all these initiatives, uh, creating a community. We have a great capacity to exchange experts, mobilize personnel, and also um, to foment the development of forums uh, intersector uh, with research community and meteorological services at a national and regional level. Uh, this is all for me. Uh, thank you very much. Tamayo for um, articulating some of the issues with regard to that collaboration between the med services and the research communities 
where often priorities are not the same, theoretically focused in one and very service oriented and need for immediate information to act and the need for that collaboration and innovative ideas for how to engage med service personnel who are often not involved in research to become more oriented in that way. I would like to highlight again the WMO research innovation in region concept note and science for services because those topics are explored and those were developed based on input from all of the regional associations within WMO where we highlighted some of those best practices and um, these are meeting the long-term goals three and four of the WMO one targeted research and the other um, engaging in much better user-oriented services. So I'd like to um, wrap up by highlighting a few of the things that were said by our speakers. Um, the importance of collaboration across disciplines and what that meant for reduction in casualties and fatalities in Brazil. The um, reason why um, it was necessary of course, the disasters that had happened in the past, SEMADEM was formed, and they gather information from multiple sectors across different centers, including private sector, academia, government departments. They do not issue the alerts themselves, but they rely on the partners in civil defense to issue those things. And they consider not only the hydrometeorological hazards, but vulnerability, exposure, population, hydrogeology, all of those multidisciplinary factors and um, they cited the success in the reduction of fatalities in recent examples in de November, December, compared with previous heavy rainfall events that they reduced those numbers, highlighting the success of this, this initiative that they've in, um, implemented. Engineer Gonzalez noted in Region Association 3 how they're working to on this initiative for early warnings, early action in response to the WMO call and the UN call and how their five working groups are seeking to work better together to um, get financing to manage the different projects. Mr. Thompson highlighted Regional Association 4's research priorities that were established at its 18th session and how the coordination and development of high resolution modeling at sub-regional levels is really important for various sectors hydrology, coastal and marine environment, atmospheric composition, and the importance of focusing on successes in transition of research to operation and learning from those, and um, embracing decision makers in co-designing, co-developing projects, and also the social science aspect. And Dr. Tamayo highlighted the importance of creating community, exchanging experts, and developing forum for, the, for dialogue and um, overcoming those differences and using those collaborations to develop tools that enable the provision of services and really enhancing that science to services pipeline. So I thank you very much for all of our speakers. I'd like to have a round of applause for everyone and I would pass on back to our moderator for the event. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a la doctora. Thank you, doctor, uh, for your moderation. To the speakers and panelists, I thank all the participants in this event that is getting to its end. In first place, the report on the climate st status in Latin America and the Caribbean has shown us that 2001 was between the sixth and seventh years, the warmest year at a global level year, and Latin America and the Caribbean are within that uh, registration and suffering the consequences. 2021 was the seventh consecutive years when at least there was a tropical a storm before the official start of the hurricane season in the Atlantic. We've, we've had 21 storms with name and then in food insecurity uh, or, or was because of several factors and the double impact of Edna and Yota hurricanes, the uh, economic effects of COVID-19 that continue to affect us uh, together with other factors. The, the uh, food insecurity in Latin America and furthermore, a total of 7.7 .7 million people 
that were exposed to very high levels of insecurity, specifically in Guatemala, Ecuador, and Nicaragua. The Latin American region is facing and will continue to face to grave climate crisis, also socioeconomic and in society in general. And because of these extreme events with the COVID-19 effect that uh, created more problems, and recently a supplementary problem, which is the effects of the Ukraine war. In uh, today's presentations, we've seen the importance of monitoring an early alert to protect populations, vulnerable populations. We've had great news. We know that to uh, face this moment of extreme events and before the need of um, better monitoring, uh, Region 3 has decided the creation of a center or system of uh, early alert system for South America, then we'll get to the financing phase. But by consensus, we cre decided the creation of this center for early alert for Latin America. To conclude, it's important to highlight that the efforts of uh, United Nations has the objective of establish associations to reinforce early alert and multiple risk systems. As all panelists have said, there's a consensus in this. We thank the broad participation of all of you online and in person with this event that is closing here. So we thank all of you, all of those that have made this possible, in particular, the host government of Colombia, this beautiful city of Cartagena. And I wanna highlight that we've had a, set, uh, a great audience from around the world uh, we're getting great um, numbers online. I think we have more than 2,000 people. So thank you all, and until next year. So I make an announcement. There's a, a small, we have a small recess. And at 11.30, we have a, another panel, one panel, sorry. So 